Praise the Lord. Oh, that was only one person. Come on, praise the Lord. Now, we got to stop that. Listen, I, I want to I help educate us here. A lot of times when a man or, you know, woman of God, whoever is exhorting the people, they give a command. Praise the Lord is a command. But what the people normally do is they give the command right back to the person. So they say praise the Lord, and then the audience says praise the Lord right back. But praise the Lord means that you begin to shout. You mean you begin to say hallelujah. You begin to say thank you, God, whatever it is. But you don't say it right back to the person. So let's try that again. Praise the Lord. There you go. There you go. Hey, Amen. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to, come back for, a lot to be thankful for as we press forward. I was just uh, sharing with our, our, our worship team. By the way, let's celebrate God for our worship arts ministry. Because technically, we know that according to the calendar that society goes by, this marks the beginning of a new year. But in the kingdom, our times are in the hands of God. David says in Psalm 31, 15, my times are in his hand. So my life is not governed by the calendar that the world provides. Did you know that the reason that we have a seven-day week is based on God's doing? So even if it wants to reject God, they don't even realize in the world that they're still operating according to his plan. When God brought the, Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt, one of the first things he did was he changed their times. Why? Because he needed them to shift from everything Egypt. They were used to the cycle of the sun. They worshiped the sun God. And so one of the first things he does is he takes them off of that time system and puts them on a different time system that is determined by the moon. So the true New Year, and there's actually a couple calendars. There's a civil calendar, and then there's a calendar that is based on the, the feast of the Lord. The head of the year or the new year is really in September, which is what we call Rosh Hashanah. This is why the last couple of years we've taught on that. And so now we begin to recognize how Jesus says, listen, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. So we're still in the world, but we don't operate entirely by the world system. And so the fact of the matter is, just like it is with everything else, God is ahead of the world and he's ahead of the devil. He'll never be right in step with the world. The world will never be able to keep up with God. So although we recognize from a natural standpoint that, yes, we've made it over in our calendars, should we have them say January 1st, 2023, understand that you are already, you've already been walking in your tomorrow. God is seated in our futures. And literally, this is just another day that the Lord has kept us. Amen. For some people, that's going to sink in a little bit later. But it's important that we begin to highlight these things because one of the things that the Lord is doing throughout the body of Christ, and it's disturbing some folks, it's, it's agitating uh, uh, some of the demons that they continue to carry in their life. Uh, and this is because he's breaking the spirit of religion. There are too many things that we just do religiously that have no significance biblically whatsoever. Or we do them and they are biblical, but because it's a good thing, we keep doing it, not realizing that God may be willing to and ready to move on to something else. That's when you become religious and, dare I say, monotonous. God is a dynamic God. Come on, Jesus, if you study his life, he really never did the same miracle the same way. He healed in a multiplicity of ways. He can deliver us in a multiplicity of ways. Come on, he can, he, there are gifts of healing. There's different things that God does. 
and we have to position ourselves to be ready to flow with him. Amen. I'll stop. Just let that marinate for a little bit. One more reminder that I want to offer is that you've heard some of the uh, and seen some of the video announcements related to a new platform that we're shifting to uh, in this new calendar year. Uh, it's called One Church. It is a church management system that is going to help us to be integrated across uh, the campus, different ministries and teams will be able to utilize this as well as guests and members. And so there was a, a tutorial, a session that was uh, provided on Zoom this past week related to how to give using this new platform, okay? And so we're going to be shifting from some of our current methods and uh, directing uh, everyone's giving, especially electronically, towards this One Church platform. We actually did record this session, so if you missed it, you can still benefit from the information that has been provided. There's a link that you can uh, tap into via email to create your profile. And so here's a quick plug. If you don't, if you've never given the church your email, this is a perfect time to do it. This month, make sure we have your email. A lot of critical information will be shared through that particular medium, okay? So if you have an email on file that is current and that you use, the link for this session that's recorded can be and will be sent to you, all right? And so these things are important because we have to move forward together, amen? All right. Uh, I want to direct our attention now uh, to the, the Word of God. I want to honor Apostle Harvey in our house uh, today, amen? God bless you, sir. How many of you have ever heard of the winter blues? You ever heard that phrase? The winter blues. Well, it's a real thing. In fact, uh, psychologists call it seasonal affective disorder. And what that means is that, that with the changing of seasons, uh, our moods, our emotions, and subsequently our behavior can begin to be influenced, and we can begin to express ourselves in ways that really are not natural to us because of us, but it's because of the seasons. Well, I want to show you this picture. Can I get that picture, a media team? Now, we've been blessed right now because uh, the weather is, is not typically January weather. Would you agree? We just had some weather that is typically January weather. It was cold. You know, I mean, that kind of cold where you put your gloves on and if, you, if you're outside long enough, your fingers are still cold. I'm talking about the kind of cold where you're like, listen, I'm not leaving the house <laughs> unless I have to kind of cold. We, we're blessed right now. And they're talking about, you know, the, 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 the weather potentially even being sustained in, in, in warmer fashion. But this image really presents uh, the effect that winter has upon us. You know, winter is a, is, a, is a time where things are laid bare. If you look at the trees, notice the leaves have fallen. And things have, they've been laid bare. In other words, something has died. And what you could not see before, you can see now. You go into the woods, there, because of the greenery, there were some things you couldn't see, but now you can see because things have been made bare. And one of the reasons that winter can be a time where you get the blues is, is, is because there's, there's, there's death, or there's, there's a transition that begins to happen. Uh, and I just want you to pay attention to your own self. We talk about self-care and self-awareness. Uh, if you're not careful, you can begin to descend into sadness. Your, your energy can begin to get zapped. One reason is because there's less sunlight. It's, it's more cloudy and overcast, and, and that can have an effect on your emotion. You start, can start to feel a bit sluggish. If you're not careful, you can start to begin to feel a little bit hopeless. Right? You know, we look forward to the sun coming out. And we can start to feel a little bit in despair because we don't see the sun day after day after day. It's important that we, we pay attention to these particular signs. If you feel like this on a daily basis, you, in fact, may have the winter blues. And just in case you have the winter blues, uh, we want to declare to you, as you've already seen via our announcements, that this is the year for a jumpstart. We want to jumpstart your faith. We want to jumpstart 
your heart in 2023. Why? God is not done. There is so much fruit that we have the potential to bear. There is so much that we have the ability to conquer and to overcome. And we cannot do it if we are strapped and hamstrung by the blues. We've got to make a decision that we're, we're going to allow the living God to flow in and through us. And it's just like if you have a car battery that goes dead, you need somebody who has the jumper cables. Anybody keep jumper cables in your car? You need somebody has, who has these jumper cables, and they can give you a jump. In other words, with those cables, there's, there's power that is transmitted, and what it does is it refreshes the battery that is gone dead or is inoperable for a limited or period of time. And what we, what we find is that in this faith journey, there are things that happen to us, trials. There, there, there are disturbances. There's, there are disruptions that, that happen to us. And some of us, if we be honest, we've been taking them on the chin. Like we've been, we've been taking a licking and we, we, uh, uh, and we keep on ticking, right? We keep going and going, but it begins to have a weathering effect on us. It can begin to wear us down. And, and before you know it, we're not praying like we used to. We're not as enthusiastic as we used to be. We're not as fervent in our desire to learn of him and to be in his word. We, 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 we're not prophesying anymore. We're, we're, not, we're not engaging in compassionate acts like we used to be. Why? Because there's something that has began to have a law in our hearts, but God is so gracious that he'll use ministers of the gospel. He'll use anointed men and women who will infuse what's on the inside of them into you, and we call that a jump start. And so our teaching series for this year is going to focus uh, largely on four A's. Apostle and I have talked about this. We're going to be focusing on the apostolic, what it, mean, what it means to be an apostolic people, a sent people, which necessarily brings us to the next A, which is ambassadors. Second Corinthians 5, 20, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. We are delegates from the kingdom of heaven sent out to different places where we live, work, study, and play, and we boldly proclaim that Jesus lives. We seek to be a blessing. We're ambassadors. And then there is activation. There, there, there's what we call impartation. In other words, there are different anointings on men and women of God in the body of Christ. And God has designed it so that as we are connected to one another, what's in me can possibly come upon you. Hallelujah. I know this very well. When I was younger, I was a teenager, and, and my, my dad in the gospel at that time, he laid hands on me, you all. He's a musician, and I began to play, I began to play instruments not long after. Why? Because there was an impartation. There was something that was activated in me with the laying on of hands that was not active in me prior to that experience. And so this is a year for activation. God wants you and me to come alive in new ways. For those of you who say, well, I don't really know how to pray. Guess what? You're going to be activated in prayer. For those of you who say, I've never really laid hands on somebody, even though I know the Bible says it. Guess what? You're going to be activated in healing techniques. Why? Because this is the year for the body of Christ to arise. Why? Because God wants to reintroduce himself to the population. He says, listen, some of my sons and daughters have not represented me well, so let me introduce myself. My name is Yahweh. My name is Elohim. I am the living God, and I prove it through those that I send. So activation will be a, a point of reference this year. And then there is acceleration. Can I tell you that God doesn't have to take a long time to do a great work in your life. God doesn't have to take a long time to do a great work in our families and in different situations. Uh, and so as God does all these things, as his word is proclaimed, and as we receive what he says, as we are activated, and as some of us have our gifts stirred up, Paul says to Timothy, stir up the gift which is in you, hallelujah, by the laying on of hands. Come on, God wants some of us to be get, become stirred again, to be rejuvenated in our faith, to have a sense of renewal. So yes, it's January, but this is the time to be jump-started so we can accelerate. We need to move a bit more speedily as the body. In other words, 
Watch this. Jesus says we got to we have to work while it's what day. There's there's things that we have to do. There is productivity that Father expects. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. And so those deposits were not made for us to sit on them. Come on, God wants us to come out of the double dutch uh, syndrome. I will, I won't. I will, I won't. No, come on. How, many, how, how long will we be undecided? And so there's, there's work for us to do, you all. We are the body of Christ. Not a man, not a woman, not a set group. We are the body of Christ. To jumpstart means to restart something rapidly or forcefully. It means to impart fresh or renewed energy. And so that's something that we intend to do this year. So make sure you stay connected. I met with our staff, and I'm just catching a lot of us up right now for, based on some things that have already occurred. I met with our staff and met with some leaders and even some folks during an Aspire Wednesday. And I shared three big rocks. Anybody ever heard the concept of big rocks? I think it's Dr. Stephen Covey wrote a book about this. Take a look at this image. Those of you who are at home on your devices and here in the sanctuary, look at the screens. Now, the only way those rocks can fit is the bigger rocks have to actually go in first. If you would try to put smaller pebbles or sand, if I had another image to show, I, I would show you different, different substances or items. And sometimes what happens in our lives is we, we focus on small things. We start to put the small pebbles in the jars of our life first. And then what happens is we don't have capacity or room for the big things. The big rocks are on the outside, and those are things that are actually essential. And so what we recognize is there are some things that we focused on uh, as the body of Christ that really are not essential. Good, okay, but not essential. And so we begin to pray and, and talk and say, what are the big rocks? And the three big rocks that we've landed on that are all infused with and tied to our aims per our vision and our mission are, number one, discipleship, uh, two, decentralization, and three, digital. Jesus said, go make disciples. So we have to focus on discipleship. Decentralization means that we're, we're re reimagining what it looks like to do the work that we do. We're willing to reimagine what it looks like to actually do ministry. We, we, we're reimagining what it looks like to actually be in this space, this campus. How do we utilize it throughout the week? We're reimagining that. We're considering some things that we've not considered before. And then with the digital rock, what we're recognizing is that we have to be where people are. Even right now, there are people with us, but they're not with us physically. Right? There, there's a streaming opportunity that they've tapped into. And so we live in a world that is increasingly digital. You've heard about paperless uh, methods that different institutions are going to. Years ago, I went to the dentist's office. This was probably 2015. And I was used to going in, getting a clipboard, and, and writing out information. But when I walked in, they handed me a tablet because they went paperless. Things have become digitized. And so we have to keep up because there are people, that's how they engage. And if we're going to reach every person's world, then we have to be prepared and equipped to engage in every man's world, right? And so digital is one of our big rocks. And so we'll talk more about this as the year moves on, but I wanted to just share this in your hearing uh, so that you would know 
how we are moving forward in the days to come. I want to also highlight our vision and our mission statement. Some may say, well, Pastor, when are you going to take your text? I'm going there in a moment. But this is critical. Why not on the very first day of January? I don't assume that everyone who's traveling with us at this point is actually aware, aware of why we exist. I'm not going to assume that. And then there are those who need to be reminded. And so I'm going to ask the media team if you can place our, our vision statement here. We've been reworking our vision. And, you know, God told Habakkuk, he said, write the vision. Make it plain. That they may run. Guess who's the they? The body. The, the they is not the pastor and his family. The, the, the they is not just the, the, the ministers or the, the, the leaders in that regard. No, they is the, the body, the church. The word of the Lord came to us and declared that we're in a building season. Well, that means all of us are. And so it's important that we share. And I want to read this in your hearing. It says, we are an apostolic, regional, governing church that exists to bring light to the world. We are a gateway church. That, meaning, that means that what happens, that we have influence. We are anointed to teach, train, and release men, women, and children to do the works of Jesus Christ. We are a prophetic people, meaning that we, we can hear God and we can, we can see what he's showing us. And a community of worshipers who love the presence of God and seek to share his presence with others. By God's grace, we will faithfully steward the gifts given to us and contribute to the advancement of his kingdom in the greater Milwaukee area and beyond. This is what we aspire to do. This is who we say we see ourselves as. And you've seen our mission statement, in fact, every week. And so let's place it on the screen one more time, a media team. And I want us to say this together. You know, I'm an educator by training, and so I'm going to be honest because a good teacher will be honest with his or her students. When we have our weekly updates and we get to this portion of the updates, I know everybody's not participating. Just like a teacher knows when everybody's not doing their homework. Because when the test comes, when the quiz comes, and no scores <laughs> are recorded, it's like, uh-oh, we got to go back and review some things. Listen, you will have what you say. So we have to say about ourselves what we believe about ourselves. If we want to see what we believe, then we've got to say what we believe. And so we don't do it just because we decided, okay, how can we, you know, add another dimension to our, our flow of service? No. We're saying this because confession is powerful. All right? So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead. Clear your throat. <clears throat> Go ahead. Swallow. <laughs> and, and, and let's recite this together as one family. I'm going to count us down, okay? Three, two, one. Equipping for the work of ministry so all can fulfill the Great Commission and express the heart of God through demonstration of the Great Commandment. Now, that was okay, but I want us to do it one more time. It sounds better than it did a few moments earlier. But now I want you to say it not just because you're reading it. Conviction comes when you actually see a thing and you say to yourself, I can do that. I see myself in that. So let's try it one more time and then we'll launch into our text for several moments. Here we go. Three, two, one. Equipping kingdom believers for the work of ministry so all can fulfill 
the Great Commission and express the heart of God through demonstration of the Great Commandment. Now, what I want you to do is just lift your hands. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you that you've given us responsibility. Lord, you've trusted us. For over 100 years, Lord, this movement has had influence, and we've been a blessing to this greater Milwaukee community, to the nation and the world. Help us, we pray, Father. Be merciful to us as we engage this mission from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention now, if you would, just go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 3. Verses 13 and 14 is what we'll read, the book of Mark, chapter 3. Verses 13 and 14 is what we will read. Here's a pop quiz question. Was Mark one of the disciples? Don't answer out loud. Answer to yourself, just in case you're wrong. <laughs> was Mark one of the disciples? This is rhetorical. Don't answer out loud. I'm going to protect the guilty. <laughs> the answer is no. I did that, one, just because I wanted to see what people's reaction would be. But secondly, it's also to help us to understand we have to know our Bible. We have to be able to answer basic questions. We have to understand the context, the history, the culture of the people that we read about. John Mark was actually one of the companions of Paul, who came later after Christ Jesus. Let's read. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that, that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. I'll read it one more time. Verse 13, and he went up on the mountain, this is Jesus, and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. I'm using as a subject for this, this short word today, very simply, him. Him. You know, there's a, there's a phrase in the culture, and that phrase is related to that particular word, him. Particularly in the sports world, and some of you who follow sports, or you may have children who are athletes, particularly in basketball, this is where I've heard this the most. When, when individuals, particularly the young men, they talk trash, right? They, they're, they're a bit braggadocious. And if, if they want you to know that they have game, that they're nobody to be messed with, one of the more popular phrases right now is for them to say, I am him. I'm him. Like, I'm that guy. Like, I'm not the one that you want to play with. <laughs> I'm him. Well, as we launch into this new month and we proceed in to 2023, the word of the Lord that's very clear to me that was dropped in my heart for this body, but I also believe this is something applicable to the body of Christ at large, is that our focus needs to be simply on him. Everybody say him. Yeah. Right now, I'm sure, and even leading up to this moment, there's been a lot of declarations and things that have been spoken about this coming year, and, and I'm not necessarily saying that any of that is wrong. But what God is helping me to realize is he wants to simplify things for us. 
and, and, and in simplifying things for us because sometimes we can get lost in the prophetic weeds. Sometimes we, could, we can become a bit, our vision can become a bit obscured because uh, if we be honest, sometimes the things that are, that are spoken can be a little bit obtuse. They can be a little difficult to, di- to discern and to interpret and to comprehend. And so it sounds good. And somebody might even hit E flat on it. And we begin to dance and to shout, uh, but two months later, we forget what was said. And so all of that is fine if it's from God, but the reality is none of it happens, none of it comes to pass without him. And so the Lord wants us to know that our new year, our new beginning, our new day, those of us who are looking for a fresh start. You know, human, human behavior is, 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 is very regular. Like, a lot of us do the same things. We say, you know what, I'll do something different at the end of the month or when the new month comes, right? I'll get to it next week. There are things that often we procrastinate about, things that we, we make plans for, and we say, okay, when that new day comes, then I'll do a new thing or I'll engage a new goal or whatever it might be. Our beginning, our new thing starts with him. Can you just say that one word, him? Let me prove it. John 1, 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning the word was, sorry, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not made anything that was made. Verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. People make a lot of resolutions. I'm not going to ask you what yours are. But I want to say to you, that although it might be a legitimate goal, I want you to set it aside for right now. Because the reality is, unless you have him, now let me distinguish something right now. Because there might be those who are not yet necessarily born again. They may be in exploration stage. They, They may be on their way. And so this really applies, I believe, to everybody. But I'm really saying this right now to those who are already born again, those of us who have already said yes to Jesus. Because what I find is, although we, we, we say that we're saved, we, we begin to live a life that's very independent of him. And so we begin to make uh, resolutions and we begin to perhaps set goals that we didn't always get from him. And what often happens is resolutions are our words. And, and, and what I'm suggesting here, what I believe God wants us to understand is that our beginning must be in him. Our turnaround must be in him. When people read the story of my life, if, if, if they read how I got over, if they begin to consider what was it that happened in your life that caused you to put down the blunt. Come on here. Can I talk to some real people? Some people say, I'll stop smoking in 2023. I'll stop drinking in 2023. And if somebody has been delivered, the fact of the matter is all they can really say is in the beginning, God. What will the narrative of your life read? If we consider 2023 a new chapter, a fresh start, an opportunity for a turnaround, how will it start? I look at the culture and people are very compelling storytellers. I look at hip hop and we got a lot of very capable storytellers. In fact, one of the best storytellers was a rapper named Notorious B.I.G. 
and Notorious B.I.G. had a hit song called Juicy in the early 90s. And he began to tell his story to help people to understand how it went from negative to positive. He said, it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, salt and pepper and heavy D up in the limousine, hanging pictures on my wall. Every Saturday, rapper tap, Mr. Magic Marley Maul. That was how he began his story. But I believe if we want to be serious about change, if we want to be serious about turnaround, if we want to be serious about overcoming, if we want to be serious about accelerating and excelling in the things of God, the beginning of our narrative needs to read like this. In the beginning, God. No, no, no. It's, it's not my dream. It's God's dream. I want my story to read with those first four words. As soon as you look at the page of the book of my life and you see how I changed, how I was transformed, those first four words I want to say, in the beginning, God. It wasn't my resolution. It wasn't because I decided I wanted to do something different. No, my motivation comes from him. This is why the Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, listen, all you need to know about how we got to this point here, in the beginning, God. How did you stop sleeping around? In the beginning, God. Yeah, yeah. How, how did you stop drinking in the beginning? God. In other words, the first thing that I did was I went to him. The first thing that happened was that I submitted myself to him. Come on, the Bible is still right in 2023. It says submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Come on, you can't put the bottle down until you submit to God. Come on, you cannot stop smoking until you submit to God. You cannot stop fornicating until you submit to God. I'm going to call out a whole bunch. You cannot stop having bad feelings and bad thoughts in your heart about people that you know or don't know unless you submit to God. You cannot stop lying and cheating and deceiving until you submit to God. The story of all of our lives needs to first read in the beginning, God. It's got to be him. And so John comes up and he follows it up in his gospel and he says, listen, hallelujah, in the beginning was the word. Why? Because the word is him. If you want things to be made new in your life, then guess what? It has to happen through him. Listen, it says all things were made through who? Him. If you say, I got to get my life together, I want my life to be different, it says, in him was life. Acts 17, 28, in him I live, I move, and have my very being. There is no ability that I have in and of my own self that will enable me to make the changes I want to make, make in my life. There is really nothing inherent in me at this point because I'm in Christ that will enable me to be successful. I function because of him. Come on, some of us can't function until we've had our McDonald's or Starbucks coffee. But we need to declare it's not the coffee that gets me going. I live and I move in him. My identity is in Christ. I got to help us because we, we become confused as the body of Christ. Because the reality is the only reason that you and I have life is because we should have died. We celebrate the fact that he died for us. But the mystery of this Christ life is that we've got to die for him. And the reason that so many people come to the precipice of a new year one, one time after the next is because there's been no true death. Why am I still struggling? It's because you haven't died yet. How come I keep having the same thoughts? It's because you haven't died yet. He died for you, but you didn't die for him yet. Oh, yeah. He died, but guess what? We are also crucified with him. Therefore, my new beginning can only occur in him. 
I, I, I really wasn't sure exactly how this was going to unfold, and I, I, I promise I'm not going to take a, a long time, but I, I need to give us some, some theology right now because sometimes we launch into New Year's with a whole lot of emotion. Well, listen, I already danced. Now I got to give you some doctrine. Romans 6.6 6 says this. Media team, you don't have this. If you can go there, that'll be good. Romans 6.6 6 says this. It says, our old self was crucified with him. You see, with New Year's, people try to do new things with their old selves. But if you're a Christian, Paul says that you died when he died. And when he was made alive, you were made alive. Christ died, I died. Christ was raised, I was raised. So therefore, it's no longer I that live, it's Christ in me. Christ is the source of my life. So if I'm really in him, then I shouldn't be beholden or I should no longer be chained or bound to certain addictions. Did I mention sugar? Sometimes we focus on alcohol too much and we seem to demonize a certain people who struggle. But guess what? A whole lot more of us are addicted to sugar. Blame it on the alcohol. Blame it on the sugar too, right? A whole lot more of us can identify with that. But whatever the affliction or the addiction, the reality is, if I'm still struggling, it's because I have not seen that my old self is crucified with Christ. I've not seen, therefore, that he is my life. So my life is in him. But if I think that it's my ability... If I'm saved and I think that because I got my master's last year and that's going to be the reason that I overcome, then I'm, I'm, I'm thinking wrongly. I have to see that my progress and my success will happen because of him. See, so Satan is wrong when he tries to tempt me with certain things because Christ cannot be tempted with certain things. Uh, Jesus is not going to ever get drunk. Jesus is never... It's not going to ever smoke weed. I just messed somebody's theology up right there. Jesus is never, ever going to sleep around. So why should I be bound by these things if I'm in Christ? It's an impossibility. It is irrational. Jesus cannot sin. John says those who are in him, they no longer sin because the seed of God rests in them. In other words, Christ is never going to contradict God. Christ is never going to go opposite of God. The part that goes opposite of God is the sin nature, and that came from Adam. So the fact is, God put us in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says, so ye have been put in him. I have been put in Christ. That's why I can overcome sin, because Christ defeated sin. So if I'm in the one who overcame and defeated sin, I'm impenetrable. That means I don't have to sin. Why? Because I live in the victorious one. God the Father put me in Christ. So I, I was included with Christ. Now I can identify myself with Christ. Because I'm in Christ, I'm no longer available for the drama. I'm no longer available for the trauma. I'm no longer available for sin. The law of sin and death no longer has a hold on me. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is active in my life. All of me belongs to him. Somebody say him. And so Paul says to us in Romans 6, 11, he says, listen, reckon yourselves, consider yourselves dead to sin, watch this, and alive unto God through 
Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is him. This is why we get baptized. Guess what? Nobody baptized symbolize, Baptism symbolizes that my life is buried. My old ways are buried. That old nature is buried. Guess what? Only dead people get buried. So when you get baptized, you are already acknowledging that I'm dead. Oh, but the problem is too many live people went into the water and you got up and you thought it was over. But no, you have not released yourself to be considered crucified with Christ. This is why Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not not I, but Christ that lives in me and the life I live. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My victory is not going to be because I'm so smart. Come on, my company going to new heights is not going to simply be just because I got a new strategy, because I read the next best business book. No, I'm going to excel because the victorious one is the author of my life. He is the finisher of my faith. And because I am in him, I will prosper. It's not going to be based just because on where you relocate yourself. Now, I'm not saying that these natural adjustments aren't important. Please understand. But we need to recognize that our foundation, our source must be seen to be in him. We have to die to the self-life, saints. <laughs> you should have shouted earlier. We have to die. You see, that's, that's why Jesus had to come. Because when presented with a choice, Adam chose his way. And Paul says the, the, the unrighteousness or the transgression of one man made many unrighteous, affected many. And so all died because all were in Adam. In other words, Adam represented the whole of humanity. And when Adam sinned, what he did was he generated or inaugurated a lineage of people who would choose themselves above God. That's why Jesus is called the last Adam. Because when the first Adam did his own thing, the last Adam came and said, this is what was supposed to happen. We make too much of the fruit. It don't matter if it was a pomegranate or an apple. The Jews actually believed that it was bread that grew on the trees. We make too much of the fruit. The point is, Adam chose knowledge of good and evil. He chose, in other words, what he chose was, I'm going to be the one who decides what's right and wrong. What that means is, I'm going to determine what's moral. What's ethical? What's criminal and what's not? He should have chose the tree of life because in choosing from the tree of life, what he would have said was, I'm nothing without my father. I'm totally dependent on who? Him. And so each one of us has an opportunity to eat the fruit that comes from the tree of life. And that fruit is Jesus. <laughs> this is why he began to talk about in John chapter 6, unless you eat of my flesh and you drink of my blood, you can have no part in me. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. What he was saying is you have to receive me. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says now he is a life-giving spirit. Because he is spirit, now he can dwell here. Now he can dwell in all who, cho who choose and receive him. And when we receive him, guess what? That necessarily means that we can no longer be the king of our lives. There can only be one king that sits on the throne. And that king must be Jesus if you want to excel in the God kind of life. If you want to live a life that is victorious over sin and over death. If you want to be one who prevails consistently and year after year, guess what? It's not going to be because you prayed so much. It's not going to be because you sang so many worship songs. I'm not contradicting myself. The point is, it's all about him. 
The Mount of Transfiguration. I'm almost done. There's Jesus. There's, there's, there, there was Moses and Elijah. The dis disciples were with them. And then all of a sudden when there was, there was no longer Moses and Elijah, the Father's voice is, is revealed and he expresses himself. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Watch this. He says, listen to him. Listen to him. If your life is, if you're feeling like my life is off the rails right now, I can't catch my breath. I can't seem to hold on. Guess what? I wonder, have you listened to him yet? We listen to a lot of people. Come on, we listen to, to, to Tamron Hall. Is that her name? We listen to now Jennifer, Jennifer Hudson because she got a show. We listen to Dr. Phil. We listen to a lot of people. But have we listened to him? The father said, this is the one that you should be listening to, him. It's in him that we have hope. It's in him that we have life. It's in him that we have a fresh start. It's in him that we are victorious over demons. It's not our church denomination. It's not our family name. It's not our pedigree. It's not in our blackness or our brownness or our whiteness. It's in him. He is Yeshua. He is, that, 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 that name, Yeshua, is intentional. Yeshua derives from the Hebrew word Yasha, which means to save, to deliver, or to rescue. So his name, his name identified his character and his purpose. So when I begin to look to him, I'm looking to the one who can save me. I'm looking to the one who can deliver me. I'm looking to the one who can change my life forever. Hallelujah. This is why Peter and John, after they healed the man at the gate called Beautiful, they were wondering how did that happen? And they said, guess what? It was his name. Through faith in his name was this man made whole. It was him. It was Jesus. The man at the pool of Bethesda. For 38 years he tried. Shout out, Pastor Jeff. I watched The Chosen, and I saw that episode. For 38 years, they showed this man trying to get to the water, trying to, trying to crawl to the water that his change might come. But it was only until Jesus showed up and asked him the question. He said, do you want to be healed? In other words, healing was in him. You don't have to go another day further in this month, in this year, struggling with the same thing. You don't have to go another hour, another moment in fear about your tomorrow. You don't have to spend another week or another, another lonely night wondering, does anybody really love me? Oh, you don't have to suffer any longer in silence because the one who delivers has arrived. He's lived. He died and he rose again. And he says, listen, all power is in my hand. Our change is in him. Jesus is the starting point. Jesus is the finishing point. Jesus is all in between. Hallelujah. In the morning when I rise, it's Jesus. In the noonday, guess what? It's Jesus. When I get ready to lay my head down at night, guess what? It's still Jesus. We become too cute in the church. We can make all kind of sentences fit together. We can, we can expound on all kinds of topics. We got seminarians galore and theologians galore, but the reality is, it's still about him. He is the light of the world. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. It's Jesus. The world is sustained right now because of Jesus. 
The Bible says, without him was not anything made that was made. So that means at nighttime, when I look at the stars, it was Jesus. When I see the moon, whether it's a half moon or a full moon, it's still Jesus. He's upholding us, you all. It's Jesus. It's his word that's keeping you alive. It's his grace that is sustaining you. So when you talk to your loved ones, I know sometimes we want to give them a bunch of scriptures. But what you need to say is, listen, in the beginning, what you need to say is, listen, Colossians 1.18, it says, he is the beginning. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going. Listen, he is the beginning. You, you, you said you cried your last tear. Okay, he's the beginning. You said, I, I'm tired of being down. He's the beginning. I, I'm not going to take any more losses. Guess what? He's the beginning of your victory. It's Jesus. Now, for those who wanted something a little bit more complicated, I'm sorry. But all I got for you today is something simple. It's about him. It's Jesus. We are nothing without him. He said, my father is the husbandman, meaning that father is the one that has made the arrangements, meaning that father is the one that has designed this thing. It's father's purpose, but he says, I'm divine. In other words, the life flows through me. And he says, you are the branches. In other words, you have no life unless it comes from divine. And Jesus says, I am him. I'm him. Not Judaism, I'm him. Not Christianity, I'm him. (laughs) Not Methodist, I'm him. Not Assembly of God, I'm him. It's him. It's him. It's not wisdom for wisdom's sake, it's him. Paul says Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. It's him. It's Jesus. It will always be Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Come on. It's not many names that when you hear it make you smile. It's not many names you hear that cause you to, to, to no longer have worries. It's not many names that you hear that cause you to start to feel good even though the situation didn't change. But when somebody begins to say the name of Jesus... Hallelujah, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus is my all in all. I can't stop talking about him. I can't stop, I can't stop singing about him. He's my all, and he's my all. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Jesus is him. This life is nothing without him. I don't have faith without him. This is an opportunity that we have today to make a fresh commitment to him. I want you to consider your life right now. John says, if we say we never sin, we lie. So if there's anybody that says, well, I'm straight, There's nothing that needs to be adjusted in my life. I question the veracity of your statement. The fact is, all of us have an area of our lives where we've not allowed him to be the leader. And so with humility, I urge you to consider your ways. Consider what's before you. Consider the plans that you have. Consider the things that you know you have to do even on tomorrow. And at the same time, recognize that your success, your prosperity, your victory will not happen except it's through him. Some of us are like Mary who fell at his feet, wiped, wiped, 
his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. We love much because we've been forgiven much. We have different stories. We came by different ways. But the reality is we're all here because of him. And before we leave today, I want to give an appeal. If there's someone watching online or here in the sanctuary, if you've not ever made a commitment to accept Jesus as Savior, today is the day. If you've not yet made a decision to allow him and receive him as Lord, today's the day. They used to tell us either he's Lord of all or, or not at all. If you've tried it your way, can't seem to overcome. And dare I say that it's because you haven't surrendered to him. If that's you, you've not saved. I want to give you an opportunity right now, whether you're online or here in the sanctuary. You want to give yourself to Jesus. This is your opportunity to do so. The altars are open. Perhaps you've walked away from Christ and you said, okay, this year I'm going to get it back right. I'm going to surrender to him all over again. Some of us might, we might just want to freshly dedicate ourselves to him. Today's the day. Why not now? And why not you? If that's you, just come to the altar. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you. If you're online, make that acknowledgement. I want to be saved. I want to be rededicated. Today is my day. I want to ask some prayer leaders to come to the front. And some might be here who you say, you know what? I want somebody to agree with me. I want somebody to hold my hand or speak life over me and speak life with me that I may move forward in faith with victory. Let us pray with you. I don't know what you did last night. I don't know what you're going to do next. But this is a divine opportunity to step up into your next season. Why don't you come? The altars are open. Everyone's eyes closed. If you're coming, come on to the front. You have a prayer need, a prayer request. Let us agree with you. If you're not coming, please close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your love and your power. And we dedicate ourselves to you even anew. Thank you for the power of the cross to do away with the old life, the old way, the old attitude. And we thank you for the victory that we have because Jesus was raised from the dead. We have new life. The old things have passed away and new things have come. New things do we declare because Jesus is him. We love you, God, and we praise you. We bless your name forever. Amen. Again, the altars will remain open. Don't leave without having that point of agreement. Be safe as you travel to your homes. We'll see you next week by the grace of God.